welcome to come out. Um, our business meeting is a little different than a lot of people. We, we still enjoy uh, praise and worship music, and we, we're still serving God even at a business meeting. Um, and then next Sunday night, uh, June the 28th, um, Pastor Judy's going to be ministering, and uh, we'd like to have everybody out for that. Um, that's all the announcements I've got. But uh, we're going to honor some fathers today. Um, Jim's got uh, all the fathers' name in a bucket. Somebody draw. Come here, Tori. We got two, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, Kenzie. Both are pawpaws. Don Lucy. <laughs> Here, take this one to the other pawpaw. I promise that was not rigged. <laughs> All right, I'm going to call the ushers up. take up the offering that is part of the worship service just so you know and a important part of it Caleb you want to pray or you want me to get down to Sister Judy. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Turn around to somebody and say, Welcome. Welcome to our online friends. And happy Father's Day to everybody. That's the Father. Praise the Lord. Let's sing this little chorus. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not go faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, how to wait. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew.
be on time. While we were yet sinners and this world was a void and we were in sin and darkness, ungodly enemies of God, He came in due time to give us life. He'll come in due time to give us life once again. We just got to keep our mind on God, got to keep our focus. I told the class we've got to keep our focus on Him, not what's going on around us. we got to keep our hope, our expectation in Christ Jesus. If He knew me before I was ever born, He knew all this mess that's going on right now. And He's already made a provision. Oh, my God, He's already made a provision for it. we just got to trust Him and do our parts as Christians. Now sing this like we mean it. And while I'm waiting, while I'm waiting, I'm still serving Him. We're still servants of the Lord while I'm waiting. Yes, they that wait upon the Lord. meditating on God and I was, I was you know thinking about my childhood I didn't have my father and I'm not one of those to play that you know he left when I was one but I had an awesome mother thank God for moms that played both roles praise yeah. God but anyway as I was sitting there meditating on it you know God laid it on my heart to give thanks unto him Abba Father you yeah. know thank you yeah. and and yeah. I just want to thank my Lord and Savior I want to thank God for my father I want to thank him for yeah. being my father and carrying me through but when you said that Isaiah 40, that was all over me this morning. That's one of my favorite verses, too. So I just want to give thanks to God. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Lord.
it's funny because, you know, I always pray about the songs ahead of time, and um, we practice on Thursdays, and it never fails whenever I go to Sunday school. Judy always preaches, <laughs> talks about what we've um, practiced, and praise God. Praise God, he's always in the midst. you leave it. 
things to pick. And I was thinking about Father's Day. My daddy was a defender, y'all. I had a good, I have a good daddy who, um, you know, I caught him about something this week and I was crying. And he can't stand my tears. And, you know, if I called him crying, he was going to fix it. So God is the same way. And Tim, you might not have had a daddy in your life, but I know if something was to happen to your family, you're a defender. So thank God, guys. You might feel like the whole world is coming against you. But your Heavenly Father is a defender. He fights for you. He fights battles for you that you don't even know about. He is on your side. If there is anything that's said about you, heaven perks up. Your Heavenly Father is ready. He's ready and he's got angels encamped about you to fight on your behalf. So don't you worry. You might feel alone today. You might feel sad. I don't know. Maybe your father's not here. But you have a heavenly father that is on guard. On guard and ready and waiting to fight on your behalf. He's a good, good father. He's a defender. He goes before you. for Steve today. He wanted to be here. Say a little prayer for him. He's at work.
Lord, we thank you, God, that you are good. You are so good to us, God. We thank you, Lord, that you're a good father, Lord, that you protect us, that you shield us, Lord. Today, we honor you. We honor you above anybody else, Lord, as we always should and as we always will, God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place, God. We thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity and the privilege, Lord, to come into your house, God. Lord, let us never take it lightly. Lord, we thank you for the word that's getting ready to come forth, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as Pastor John comes to bring the word. Praise the Lord, church. I'm just glad to be in church today. Praise the Lord. Mm. <laughs> How many is excited for the word today? Mm, I believe that we've got everybody going to be staying out with us today, so we're excited about that. Praise the Lord. Mm. Look over at your neighbor and smile real big. <laughs> now find another neighbor and smile at them too. Now find somebody across the way and just wave at them. Just wave at them. Say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mm, 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 mm. You all right? If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and be turning with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 15. Mm, 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 mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm. Y'all feel that? They, 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 we, we need to just, somebody just do this. Just do this. Just shake it off. Just shake it off. Now, now the other hand, say, shake it off. Just shake it off. Look at your other neighbor and say, shake it off. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because mm. today we're going to worship the Lord. And we're going to praise the Lord. And I don't care what the devil's trying to do. My God is going to be first and foremost in his house. So we're going to believe that he's going to move in this place today. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to start reading in verse number 11. The Bible says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. <laughs> so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there, he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. <laughs> when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for each and every person that's gathered here in your name to worship you and to lift your name up. Lord, today in Jesus' name, we speak freedom, we speak liberty, we speak deliverance over the house today, God. Lord, move in every heart, move in every life. Forever change us through the ministering of your word. We give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. For it's in the name of Jesus that we ask it. And the church said, Amen. praise the Lord. Now, church, today is a very special day. Today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day. Today we celebrate you. Happy Father's Day, everybody. 
Now this is for both natural and spiritual fathers. This is your day, so you need to enjoy your day. We wouldn't be here without you. Praise the Lord. So we need to show some love to our fathers today. And I also got to give some appreciation to all the spiritual fathers too. And I'm going to move this. I stepped on this thing like four times last week. So I'm going to slide that back there so I don't break it and I don't trip and y'all don't laugh. How about that? Works out good for everybody. <laughs> but we got to give some appreciation to all of our spiritual fathers as well because without our spiritual fathers some of us definitely wouldn't be here so today we got to celebrate everybody who's poured into our lives to help mold us and help shape us into the people that we are today and we say thank you for all you've done and for all you are so today again we say happy Father's Day to all of our fathers we love you and we appreciate you very much can we give them one more hand? Mm. <laughs> I got to say, church, I'm excited about what God has got for us today. Just to be quite honest with you, I've battled and I've struggled with this thing all week long. And I got about 10 different messages running around in my head. So y'all pray for me because I believe the Lord's going to do some amazing things in this house today. But how many know we got to push on through? We got to push on through. We, we got, look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to push through. I'm going to push through. I came to get something, and I'm going to get it regardless. It doesn't matter if anybody wants to stay down in the mully grubs, that's up to them. If they want to stay depressed, that's up to them. But I came to push on through and get what God's got for me today. How about you? Because God wants to do some amazing things, and I, for one, want to see him move in his house today. Now, as we move into the introduction, i got to point out a couple of things, which honestly, it could be part of the reason why some of us are here thinking, oh, yeah, it's going to be a Father's Day. He's going to talk to all the daddies, and he's going to pat them all on the back, and he's going to tell them, y'all, just all awesome this and awesome that. But see, this message is centered around fathers in this day, but I want all the ladies to know that this word is for you, too, because today's word is not gender-specific. It's for all of us. So if you thought you was going to walk up in New Day and hear something that didn't apply to you, mm, that ain't going to happen. So this is for everybody, all right? Okay, now the number two thing I got to point out to you and I got to say is this, I need everybody in the place today to make a promise. Okay, I need y'all to promise with me that we're going to be real today, that we're going to be genuine today and we're going to be honest. Now, why are you saying that for? Well, I just got to tell you because in this, mm, this I already might be hurting some feelings in here, but, but a lot of times church folk are the most fake folks you ever know. They'd be fighting for three days at home. They ain't spoke to each other in three days. They walk in the building and it's like, praise the Lord, brother. How you doing? God is just so good. We've been praying for you. You ain't even spoke to each other in three days. You ain't prayed for nobody together. So today, I need for us to be genuine, and I need for us to be honest, and I need for us to set aside our nervous. I need for us to set aside our what they going to think mentality. Because see, what I believe that if we do that, then the Lord is going to move in this place, and lives are going to be touched, and people are going to be changed, and families will be mended, captives will be set free. So today can be and should be a day where we can leave different from the way we came in if we're transparent before the Lord so can we make that promise together because I just got to be honest with you church I'm tired of fake I'm tired of fronts and I'm tired of masks I came for a genuine experience with God I came to see him I came to meet with him and it doesn't matter to me what's going on around me because I'm going to reach out and I'm going to touch the Lord how about you hmm so today we're going to keep on going in our series called Come On In The House. And the title for today's message is this, Be There, A Father's Love. Now I want to give us some context for the passage today so we can appreciate the content of what we're going to dive into. Now a lot of us have heard this story ever since we was kids. Some of us was brought up in Sunday school and we grew up and we heard it there or we heard it in vacation Bible school or we heard it at some point during a church service that we've been a part of. Now I preached it and taught it a whole lot of times because see it's a very popular Bible story that we've all came to know and appreciate as the prodigal son. 
Now Jesus is the type of teacher who used a lot of illustrations and a lot of stories to bring some points across. They're called parables. And in other words, what Jesus did a lot of times is use things that people knew about to teach them things that they didn't know about. Now, in this particular chapter, Jesus tells three stories. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, I want to give us a little bit more context so we can appreciate this content. Because when we jump into this chapter, what we see in verse 1 is this. And this is awesome. To illustrate, uh, that's verse 11, need verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Now what I already see here, and I'm about to have church by myself, because what I'm about to see here is that the folks coming to hear Jesus wasn't your usual everyday church people. See, the text says that crooks and crazy people came to hear Jesus teach. And that'll preach right there, because I believe that there's people in this world now who's looking for a word. And in a lot of places and in a lot of spaces, there's some people in church just keeping certain certain people from hearing about Jesus because see the more I think about it and this may offend some people but that's all right because I guess got to say what God put on my heart but the more I think about it the more I realize that most people don't have a problem with God it's church people they don't like mm, come on now church I believe in a lot of places the church has become its own worst enemy because when you got to look a certain way when you got to act a certain way when you got to dress a certain way read the right version of the Bible pray a certain way and smell a certain way to be accepted guess what that's a problem but there's some places out there that's got more rules to get in and be accepted than any other place on the face of the earth but I just believe that in this day and in this hour God is raising up a remnant God is bringing together a group of people who ain't worried about what you look like they ain't worried about how much money you got they ain't worried about about whether you speak King James or whether you speak NLT. Some of you heard me preach this before and I hope you never get tired of it because some of us have, got, have been to realize that the Lord's been mighty good to me and I ain't got time to criticize and I ain't got time to judge anybody else because I got too much to thank my God for to judge anybody else and condemn anybody else and put them down. And guess what church it ain't my house, it ain't your house so we don't get to make the rules anyway it's God's house and he says come just as you are hmm. <laughs> see the ground's level at the foot of the cross and it's my prayer that New Day will always be that place that place where everybody welcome that place where it doesn't matter where you've been the place where it ain't about your history it's about your destiny and I believe church that we on the edge of an explosion I believe there's a revival getting ready to break loose around here cause people can come in here and get a word without judgment without condemnation and without fear of what everybody else gonna think the Bible says tax collectors and notorious sinners often came to hear Jesus teach Hmm. See, church, I believe God's setting us up for overflow. Because, see, when you, when you, there's a lot of times people go to certain places, those places try to make those people look like their place. When Jesus said, I got a word for everybody. You see, I thank God this is a place where we realize we don't have to be perfect to come because a fish has got to be caught before it can be cleaned. Come just as you are, but you won't leave the way you came. I'm fitting to have church up here by myself because I am so glad that God took me as I was and he still takes me just as I am, church. He's still in the cleaning business. He's still in the restoration business. He's still in the saving business. My God is still saving, healing, and delivering. Is anybody grateful that he's still there and he took you as you were? Hmm. So the Bible tells us that Jesus had all types of people who came to hear him teach. 
And then we get into our text. And what I want to do, church, is I want to go back and I want to break it down for us, okay? So if we go back and we look at Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12, you see the Bible teaches us that Jesus wanted to illustrate a point even more. He told them a story. He said, a man has two sons. And then in verse 12, he says, the younger son told his father, I want my share. I want my share. Now, you see... <laughs> Honestly, church, uh, the fact that he had a he had a share of the estate before before his father died that ain't something crazy. Cause what would happen is that the, when the father died, it would be as almost like sort of an insurance policy, and he would have like an estate set aside for his sons. So let me modernize this story for us. Basically, what he was telling the father was this: I ain't got time to wait for you to die. <laughs> Give me what's mine now. I know you're going to leave me something when you die, but do me a favor. Because, see, there's a difference between what you say and what people hear. You ever been told one thing, but you heard something else? <laughs> so what he was really saying was, since you won't die, go ahead and give me your stuff. Can I say something right here on this Father's Day 2020? I said something similar on Mother's Day, and it's true on Father's Day too. You better love and respect your father and your spiritual fathers. Because what I want to point out is right now, in the, in the time we're living in right now, there's little reverence and little respect for our elders. I can remember a day when I was coming up, if you didn't treat your parents and your grandparents with respect, you might get the taste smacked out of your mouth. My Lord, you might have a hard time sitting down to play your video games and a hard time talking on that $400 iPhone if you was disrespecting your parents and your grandparents. I remember that day, church. And one of the things that is so concerning to me as you look at the world we live in today is the younger generation shows no respect to those in authority. <laughs> I see the way some parents get talked to. I see the way some grandparents are treated. I see the way teachers is looked at. I see the way authority figures are put down. And quite honestly, it's no wonder the world's in the shape it's in because he ain't no honor given to those who deserve it. Ephesians 6, 2 says, honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with promise. You see, so this father don't work his whole life trying to leave something for his kids. Can you imagine? Some of us ain't got to imagine. But can you imagine going to a job that you don't like? <laughs> Maybe you can imagine having a boss you don't like and you telling yourself no when you wanted to say yes just so you can leave something for your babies. <laughs> and then this ungrateful child <laughs> looks you in the face it says, since you won't die, just give me everything's due to me now. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I don't care who you are. You did not get to where you are by yourself. Somebody somewhere poured something into you, something to help shape you and mold you and make you who you are today. For some, it may be parents. For some, it may be grandparents. For some, it might be that dude that you went to church with when you was a kid. But we all got somebody who poured something into us and helped make us who we are today. Let me tell you something, church. Everything I am today as a man, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a human being is because I had some people pushing me and teaching me and shaping me. I am who I am because what others sacrificed to put into me. Thank God for good parents. Thank God for good grandparents. Thank God for who saw for those who saw fit to pour out themselves into my life to make me who I am today. Is anybody grateful for those who poured had enough love for you to not let you go? Even in your crazy, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but even in your crazy season, even in your, I'll go ahead and say it now because I had one myself, even in your season of stupid, they still prayed for you. They still said, don't you talk about him. Don't you talk about them. I know where he's at now, but that ain't where he's going to land. That ain't where he's going to stay. I'm going to pray him through regardless. I thank God for those who did that for me. It took me under their wing and under their care and helped form me into the man 
than I am today. And I am so glad that they did. Mm. Mm. So this man's dealing with some stuff in his house. And it's important to see that the guy we're talking about today is the younger son. Now, younger doesn't necessarily speak to his age. Some of you already know where this is going. It speaks to his maturity. <laughs> See, I just want to say that I'm thankful that Jesus didn't say how old this guy was because if Jesus would have said he was 20 or 20-something, 20 we'd have put him in a box. Had he said he was 30-something or a teenager, we'd have put him in a box. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, but boxes are for things, not for people. So Jesus says, I'm just going to call him younger. Because the fact is, you can be old and still be foolish. You can have a little gray on the top or have a little nothing on the top, but no wisdom on the inside. So by saying the younger son, it could be in years, but we also know we're talking about not just the years, but also the maturity level. So the question becomes, what happens when they're in the house, but they're immature? <laughs> we see it right here in the story. The first thing that happens is he became restless. He tired of having to stay in the house. <laughs> and I got to submit to you, there's a lot of people who's in the house, but they're restless. And I know there's a lot of folks that's starting to feel a little restless. But we got to use this season we're in for what it is. And that is a season of development. If we don't allow God to grow us and develop us and to mature us, we'll get restless. And I got to let you know the problem I have with being restless is, watch this, when you get restless, there's two things that's going to start screaming. Your spirit and your flesh. And can I repeat something I said I was going to repeat many times? Social distancing should lead to spiritual intimacy. And when we begin to get restless, if we won't come closer to God, then flesh will get bored. I'm tired of doing this. Why we got to do it this way? I got to find something to do. And what happens is we choose to try to be entertained instead of trying to be empowered. Mm -hmm. we can find ourselves scrolling instead of praying we can find ourselves reading everybody else's story and not his story we can find ourselves talking, talking about everybody else and not talking to him we can catch ourselves doing what we want to do and not what he wants us to do. See, if we ain't careful, we find ourselves having social intimacy with spiritual distancing. And when that happens, we find ourselves in toxic places. Maybe not in our flesh, but in our minds. We can find ourselves in toxic attitudes. We can find ourselves in toxic emotional places. If we ain't careful, we can, be, we can find ourselves being just like the children of Israel. Oh, we had it better back in Egypt. Oh, we, 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 we might have been, we, we been starving, but at least we did what we wanted to do. <laughs> or you can find yourself beginning to look back at your past, how you used to do this, you used to do that. And before you know it, you done got restless, and you're back in some stuff you shouldn't be in. Can I tell you something that hit me this morning? It hit me just this morning. I'm in there. I'm typing like crazy. Different levels of elevation require different levels of training. Mm, some of y'all mm, some of y'all ain't going to be happy. Mm, this, might, this, this might hurt some feelings. But a lot of people say they want the next level of spiritual intimacy, but they want the same level of commitment and training. I'll never forget. I coached for over 20 years. I have one parent ever questioned me about my son's playing time and position. Worst possible time to talk to me too, right after we lost the game. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, when they did, I looked at them and I said, if you want his position and playing time, then pay the same price he paid to get there. Woo. Say, what do you mean? Where was you at whenever he was, he was swinging the bat 400 times in a day? 
Where was you at when he was fielding ground balls for two hours in a day? Where was you at when he was putting the time in, in to get to where he's at? Let me put this another way. When I was in kindergarten, I was able to color and play and take naps and eat snacks and drink Kool-Aid. That was fun. But when I went to high school, it was a different world. So for me to be on that level, it required me to not color, play, take naps, eat snacks, and drink Kool-Aid. You see, the problem in a lot of areas in the body of Christ is we got a lot of people who want to be in high school spiritually, but they still want to take naps, color, eat snacks, and take naps, and drink Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're talking to some people they shouldn't be talking to. They're hanging out with folks who they shouldn't be hanging out with. They're doing some stuff they shouldn't be doing. They're looking at stuff they shouldn't be looking at. Now, please don't get me wrong, church. I'm not saying they're sinning because there ain't nothing wrong with naps, snacks, and Kool-Aid. <laughs> but if you want to get to the next level, there's some things we got to put down. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, guess what? I put away childish things. And a lot of times it's because they got reckless. And we can see the proof of his recklessness, restlessness in verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. See, he was begging for the stuff. But then in verse 13, there's a time frame between him getting the stuff and him leaving the house. And that lets us know the real problem wasn't that he wanted the stuff. The real problem was he didn't want accountability. Ooh, my Lord, we're going after the devil today. Mm -hmm. See, the problem wasn't he wanted money. The real problem was he wanted his independence. He wanted his way. See, there may be somebody who's watching who's getting irritated who said, Lord, if you do this, then I'll do that. Lord, if you help me have my way, then I'll do this. Can I help somebody today? <laughs> the problem is even if God gave them their way, the problem isn't that, that, that they want that. The problem is they don't want God to make them submit. Because the fact of the matter is that God has given people some things that they asked for and they still didn't make a sacrifice. They still didn't change anything about themselves. And their attitude and their actions and their habits are all still the same as they've always been. And they still want God to give them everything they want. Different levels of elevation require different levels. You see, there's people who want God's stuff, but they don't want him. And then, now let me flip that coin here because there's people who will like you, support you, be there for you, and promise you the moon until you say no. And then they gone. And it's my prayer that in this season, God will send people who will love me past what I can do for them. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There's some of us who need this season that we're in to be a swipe left season. In other words, when toxic people are trying to ring you up, swipe left. Let me put this another way so some of us can get it. I'm about to practice social distancing from non-essential people. Mm. When they call you tomorrow and you don't answer, when they call you next week and you don't answer, then they see you on social media to act, why are you acting funny? You can tell, I ain't acting funny. I'm practicing social distancing, and that means that I am no longer available to people who don't push me into destiny and who, don't, who holds me back from who I am and where I'm going to be. I ain't got time for people who don't love me. I ain't going to be connected with people who won't push me or keep me moving into my promised land. We moving forward. We crossing Jordan. I don't want to leave you out, but I will leave you behind. I ain't got time for non-essential people. So watch this. The Bible says that a few days later, he moved to a distant land. One translation says he moved far away. And some people might ask, how far did he move? That doesn't matter. <laughs> because any place God ain't in is too far. Any place that God ain't in is too far. And I know there's been people who've taught and people who's preached and people who've said for years that he left the church. But I know some folks that's lost sitting in church. Hmm. <laughs> Because they're sitting in a building, but they connected to a group that ain't connected to God. So even though they in the house, they disconnected. So how do I know I'm still connected to God? Because no matter where I am, it's still church. Yeah. 
If I'm riding in my car, there's church. If I'm on my job, it's church. When I feel good, it's church. When I feel bad, it's church. In hard times, it's church. Why? Because social distancing should lead to spiritual intimacy. And sometimes God causes or allows certain things to happen to pull me away from certain stuff and certain people so I can get closer to him. But he allowed himself to get pulled out of the house. And if we're not careful during this time we're in, there's going to be some who practice spiritual distancing and social intimacy. We got to grow and we got to mature. We got to get more connected to God or we'll find ourselves practicing social intimacy and spiritual distancing. What do you mean, Brother John? If we're not careful, we can find ourselves disconnecting from God but connecting to the wrong people. So because he was disconnected to the, in the house, the Bible tells in Luke 15 and 13, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. See, that's important. Not only did he become restless, but his restlessness led him to becoming reckless. The text said he had a season of wild living. So what does that mean? You ready? A season of wild living is a season where I lowered my standards. It's a season where I lowered my standards. I got to submit to you he traded all his stuff for some money. So if I can modernize this for us today, he took his inheritance, which was probably some cattle, some livestock, probably a deed to some property, and he traded it in or he pawned it for money. He pawned it for money. He pawned what he had. Now, I'm about to tell you some things, and I hope you can receive them because this is powerful and it's strong. Because what's my problem with pawn shops? <laughs> my problem with a pawn shop is I don't get what it's worth. I get what I can get. <laughs> the problem I got with a pawn shop is I don't get what I'm worth. I get what I can get. And there's a lot of people right now who's frustrated and irritated because you're wondering why they don't treat you right and why they don't act like they should. It's because they got you on sale. <laughs> Because you met them in a wild place and they got you at a wild price. And because they got you at a wild price, they only value you at your discounted rate and not your actual rate. Don't you dare pawn off God's property, honey. You are worth way more than pawn shop prices. You a son of the king. You a daughter of God. You deserve full price. Don't you forget that and don't you settle for less. If somebody don't pay full price for something, they don't value it the same. I'm about to have church up here by myself. If somebody wants to get connected to you in this season, they better be ready to pay full price. Don't accept pawn shop prices for who you are and what you represent. Don't take less than what you worth, honey. Huh. It's time to quit putting yourself on discount for people who don't appreciate your favor and your gifts and your calling. If you knew how much you was worth, they would have or they would be treating you a whole lot better because you are valuable to your God. So the text shows us that he's reckless. Can I ask you a question? Because this is the part of the message where I'm supposed to beat this guy up. I'm supposed to beat him up. My Lord, I'm supposed to talk about how he should have never left that house and he should have never done this and he should have never done that. And bless God, if he'd have just stayed there, everything would have been just fine. Y'all have heard that message before. <laughs> but I'm about to separate the real from the fake. <laughs> Y'all remember at the beginning when I told you I needed everybody to be transparent? Because I know that there's going to be some who try to wear a mask, and that's okay because I ain't talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to some folks who want to open up and let God do something special today in their life. See, how many is willing to admit, yes, Pastor, I'm saved. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. But I had a reckless season. 
oh, I can worship with the best of them, but there's a time when I can do other things with the best of them too. I've been through a crazy season. See, that's why when some people see me, they look amazed because they know who I used to be. And a lot of times in church, they get in church and they get a bad case of the amnesia because a lot of people get so busy trying to fit in, they forget God called them to break out. And too many people done fell in love with the am and forgot they be. In other words, I've said it before, I am saved, but I used to be a hot mess. I am a warrior for God, but I used to be fighting for something else. I am drunk on new wine, but I used to be drunk on the old stuff. I am speaking in a heavenly language, but I used to be speaking a different tongue. I got to tell you, I ain't shouting because of who I am. I'm shouting because I know where he brought me from and what I used to be. I'm still thankful that God brought me out. So he's reckless. And the Bible tells us he's connected to some people. And sometimes your reckless season is connected to the wild people you connect to. See, people are wild people when they take you backward instead of taking you forward. And that's why focus is so important right now. You see, we can't allow ourselves to get caught up in little minor petty things that don't matter. I made up my mind in this season. I got too much to deal with without having to deal with petty. I need some people and some things who's building my faith. I need some people who's going to help me and not hold me back. So I came to tell some folks that it's time to deal with reckless. Because if we don't take care of our reckless, there'll be a season of reckoning. Because, see, that's what happened in verse 14 in our story, Luke 15, 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. See, i got to read that from a, to a, from a different version. The NASB says, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be impoverished. See, notice the text told us that the famine hit that country. It didn't hit him. And we need to see this because I know that the Bible says he began to starve. But what we need to see is that a lot of times our prosperity is tied to our geography. Can I preach right here? Sometimes our protection is connected to our geography. Let me make that sense, make sense. We looked at this last week. God said, death is coming to this place, but where your position matters. If you ain't in the right place, you're going to have to deal with some stuff. That's why some of us can find ourselves having to deal with certain things at certain times. Because where we're positioned in our minds, in our emotions, and in our attitudes. Because if we're not in the right place, then we'll have to deal with some stuff. But for everybody who's in the house, it'll pass over you. This guy was going through a famine because of where he is. And some of us find ourselves at times going through some stuff in our lives and in our minds and in our hearts simply because of where we are physically, emotionally and spiritually because see what we got to see he going through a famine because of where he is because get this, daddy ain't hurting mm. everybody at his father's house is good you see there's consequences when you leave the house when you leave the house physically, when you leave the house emotionally, when you leave the house spiritually. And I believe that there's people who's found themselves going through stuff because they're in the wrong place. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I want to talk to somebody right now who's frustrated, aggravated, and irritated because the season you find yourself in right now ain't because you're a bad person. you got a big heart and you found yourself around people who's praying on you and not praying for you. Mm, and now you're dealing with these emotions and these feelings and placing and blame in all the wrong places. See, part of I, I believe part of what this series is about we're in is to let people know who's been hurt, who's been betrayed, who's been disappointed by people in places that should have never said that, done that, or acted like that. It's time to realize that what happened was not God. And now it's time to come on back in the house. Come on back and get reconnected. Come on back and get restored come on back and get rededicated come on back in the house because <laughs> see here's the thing <laughs> the famine is still going to be there 
But you got to make the decision to get up and leave from where you are and go to where you're supposed to be. Sometimes it takes a famine to make us move. Huh. You see, so today what I want to do is I want to speak over your family. And I want to speak over your loved ones. And I want to say, if they hear, if they ain't, they coming back. They coming in. Sons and daughters are coming in. Mothers and fathers are coming in. Brothers and sisters are coming in. Cousins and uncles and aunts, they coming in. They are coming in. And if you hear and you got a lost loved one and you ain't believing God, then shame on you. If you got lost loved ones that's in a reckless season and you ain't praising God for their breakthrough, shame on you. I'm praising God because I know mine's coming in. His word won't return void. It's going to accomplish everything it's been sent forth to do. Hmm. And I know, I know some of you sitting there thinking this is just some kind of emotional response I'm trying to get, trying to pump up the crowd. Huh. And I'm trying to get everybody to shout. Well, if that's where your faith is, then go ahead and stay in that land of famine. Hmm. <laughs> Go ahead and stay right there in that place. But as for me, I'm sick and tired of sitting in depression. I'm sick and tired of sitting in despair. I'm sick and tired of sitting in anxiety. I'm sick and tired of sitting in the molly groves. I'm coming out because I believe God. See, when I'm talking about come on in the house, I'm not necessarily talking about a natural house or a natural church, although that's very important, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about staying in his house, in his presence. My Lord, this, this is powerful. We need to catch this. The blessing on my life is tied to my ability to stay in the right position. Mm. The blessing on my life is tied to my ability to stay in the right, in the right position and my, and my steadfastness to stay in the right position. I got to say something and some of you might not like it. <laughs> There's some people that you're just going to have to tell, I can't come out. <laughs> There's some people you're just going to have to tell, I can't come out and play. Y'all may not believe this. Whenever me and Pam, we lived in an apartment, whenever uh, John was just a, well, just, just a small kid, and there was this little boy that lived across the street. He used to come over and knock on the door and want to know if I could come out and play. <laughs> Can John come out and play? And there was times I told her, I said, no, tell, tell him I can't come out. <laughs> You see, there's some people you're going to have to tell, I can't come out. I ain't going to let you drag me out of where I am to where you want me to be. I refuse to allow, let you bring me into anger. I refuse to let you bring me into depression. I refuse to let you bring me into bitterness. I refuse to allow you to bring me out the house. You see, something we got to see right now is in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Hmm. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? There's too much going on right now. I can't come out. I can't come down. I got to stay in the house. I got too much going on in this season. I got to pray. I got too much going on to get pulled into negative conversations and negative attitudes. God bless you. I love you, but I got to go. God's got a great work for me to do, and I cannot come down. I will stay in the house. See, here's the fact, and we've said this quite a bit here lately. The devil specializes in weapons of mass distractions. He knows how to bring you out the house. He knows how to bring the right person or the wrong person, depending on how you look at it, into your life to bring you out. He knows how to bring the right things in your life to bring you out. He knows how to create the right conflict to bring you out. He knows how to bring the right disagreement in your life to bring you out. He knows how to use his weapons of mass distractions. So in this season, in this time we're living in, I came to tell somebody today to stay in the house. Don't let them bring you out. Don't let him pull you away. During this season, we got to stay more focused than ever before. We got to be more dedicated. 
dedicated than ever before, more prayerful than ever before, more studious than ever before. And I know there's a lot of things going on right now, church. Don't get me wrong. But when you in the house, it may happen around you, but it won't be going on inside you. <laughs> See, that's what happened with the three Hebrew boys. They could be put in the fire, and the fire didn't burn them up because what's in them burned brighter than what's around them. And I came to tell somebody today to stay in the house. We got to catch this. Luke chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But nobody gave him anything. I hope you see this. Oh, I hope you see this. And I need you to know at the beginning of this story, he was spending his money on people. But when he was down, <laughs> come on now. When he was down, wouldn't nobody give him nothing. When he had it, everybody had it. But when he lost it, he couldn't find anybody to call. And ain't it funny how the same people who don't mind taking are a lot of times the same people who don't ever want to give. My Lord, I'm preaching to somebody right now because you've been giving and you've been pouring in and you've been giving and you've been giving and you've been giving and now you find yourself in a season of need and nobody wants to be there for you. you always been the one who was there for everybody. But now, where are they at when you need somebody? This is for somebody today. He got a job, and the man he was working for sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Then verse 16, the Bible tells us he became hungry. So my question is this. How you working and ain't getting paid? <laughs> how you working and ain't getting paid? See, if I'm working, I'm getting paid. So this dude went from being a son to a servant, from a son to a slave. Because when you come out the house, you lose rank. He went from steak and baked potato every night. He went from having servants. He went from having everything he ever needed. He went from eating whatever he wanted to now he's thinking about eating the pig's leftovers. And some are sitting here thinking, that would never happen to me. But let me give you an analogy some of you are going to get. Sometimes desperation plus no resources or support equals doing some things you never thought you'd do. Some of us have found ourselves in situations we thought we would never be in because life had dealt us some circumstances where we did what we felt like we had to do. They some who settled for less than simply because you felt like you didn't deserve better. Some have been in relationships you never thought you'd be in. Letting people say things to you and treat you in ways they should have never treated you because you thought that's what you had to do. So i got to tell some folks in here today, before you go around and try to judge somebody and criticize somebody for what they got going on, and before we try to put somebody down for doing some things we might not like, sometimes you don't understand what their situation is. Now, please don't get me wrong because there's going to be somebody going to watch this video and they're going to go around and they're going to say, oh, he was up there telling people they can do what they want, live any old way, and not worry about it. No, ma'am, and no, sir. I'm not saying I agree with doing wrong or I agree with sin. But what I am saying is that the church for too long has turned up and, oh, y'all got to leave me, y'all got to pardon me because I get emotional when I start talking about this. But the church for too long has turned up they self-righteous, hypocritical, knows and said well they will never come in my church looking like that they will never come in my church acting like that they will never come in my church smelling like that oh they smell like this and they smell like that but guess what you smell like hypocrisy and judgmental religion and to me my lord to me, that stinks worse than anything they can smell like. It's time to kick the religious spirits out the church because guess what, church? they exactly right. They will never go in your church, but bless God, I hope and pray they go in his. My Lord, I hope and pray they find their way to New Day. I pray they find their way to a place that will love them just like they are and help lead them and help guide them and help mentor them and help disciple them until 
they can go out and make disciples of others. Mm. So this guy got him in a place where he was willing to accept whatever he could get. And you know, there's some folks maybe in this room who's looking for something or looking for somebody so hard that you'll almost take whatever or whoever you can get. Can I tell you part of the problem right now is you tolerating things you shouldn't be tolerating? You eating from places you shouldn't be eating from. You accepting things and people that you shouldn't accept. Because when he was in the house, he was eating at a table. When he was out the house, he was eating off the ground. See, the levels are different. When he's in the house, his meals was brought to him. When he's out the house, he had to go find whatever he could find. And some of us have found ourselves in situations praying for God to give up, get us out of these situations that we walk right into on our own. And sometimes God will allow you to eat slop because he knows that the slop will bring you to your senses. I'm about to show you something. I hope it hits you like it did me in Luke 15, 17. When he finally came to his senses... He said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I don't think you caught that. <laughs> you see, in the previous verse, he hired himself to somebody and he's out there with the pigs. He's eating pig slop. And then all of a sudden, he came to his senses. Now, this is just me, but I believe it was the smell of the food that brought him to his senses. Now, see, I don't know how many here know nothing about boxing. I mean, Bob knows about choking people out. I know that. But whenever somebody gets knocked out, they don't revive him by saying, Hey, Bob, wake up. <laughs> they don't tap him on the shoulder and say, Avery, hey, man, get up. They don't shout at him to get up. They break these things called smelling salts in his nose. And then they start shaking and they come to their senses. Because, see, I believe if God would have told him to go home when he had a little bit left, he'd have went home with an attitude. <laughs> But when he got to where he was smelling the pig slop. <laughs> In other words, when the smell of his current season brought him to his senses. Can I tell you this? The only way you're going to smell pig slop is if you get on your knees and you get in it. You got to get close enough to smell something. And sometimes God allows us to go through an ugly season because that's the only thing that will bring us back to our knees. And I came to tell somebody today, you, you ain't got a prayer life until you find yourself in a situation that don't smell good. Until you hit rock bottom. Until that loved one hits rock bottom. Until that doctor says, no way. Until, you come, until they come to get that car. Until them lights go out. Until they tell you that your kid has got this and your kid's got that. Until they tell you that you can't do this and can't do that. See, that don't smell good. But until you learn to pray in a season that don't smell good. Until you pray in a season where everything around you is hurting hurting and everything around you ain't making no sense and everything around you is pushing you and pulling you and tearing you until you can cry out and you can say God if I have ever needed you I need you now I want you to get the mental picture we're getting we're closing we're closing I want you to get the mental picture he looks over his shoulder into the house he sees them sitting at the dinner table. They laughing, they joking, they eating, they having a good time. And the people he's looking at probably don't even have what he left to be where he's at now. And they look so happy. And then he reaches down to get those leftovers. And he's like, I can't eat this anymore. But then his stomach starts growling. Let me tell you this, when your stomach's growling, that means you're hungry. And these folks who's been hanging with the wrong people who your mind don't like but your stomach started growling you needed some friends. <laughs> There's some folks that's finding themselves doing some things that your mind just don't get but your stomach's growling. There's some people who can say this in this room I've made some bad choices on an empty stomach. <laughs> See, when you get hungry long enough, you start doing things and you start acting in ways you wouldn't normally act. You start saying things you normally wouldn't say and you start doing things you normally wouldn't do. 
And there's some people who've been practicing social distancing without spiritual intimacy, and it's created a gap in an empty place. And God's saying to you today, Psalms 34 and 8, taste and see the Lord is good. Jesus is saying in John 6 and 54 to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Jesus is saying, get in my presence. Fill your spirit, John 4, 14. So he looks around and he reaches out and he grabs that piece of leftover food and he brings it close to his nose. And I believe the smell triggered something in him and he remembered his house. And it says in Luke 15, 17, when he came to himself, and can I just tell some folks something? It's time for some of us to start having some conversations with ourselves. Some of us need to tell ourselves it's time to stop playing. It's time to become all that God wants me to become. Some of us need to tell ourselves it's time to stop running. It's time to do what I'm supposed to do. It's time to stop settling for average and mediocrity. It's time to start telling ourselves you better than how you acting. You better than how you've been doing. You better than that. There's a calling and there's a gift on the inside of you that needs to come out. I am who God says I am. But I got to have a conversation with myself. God says your season of being down is about to be over. He wants to do a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I do a new thing. Shall you not know it? God wants to do something special in your life. Come on, musicians, y'all, come on. I'm closing, but I got to show you this. Man says, I got to go home because where I am is beneath me. I'm about to go home, and today I got to declare over somebody's life, you'll no longer settle. You will be focused. You will be locked in. So as they begin to play, if anything I say in these next few minutes touches your heart, to the point where you say, I need to talk to God. Then I need you to know this altar's open. And this is going to be strange and it's going to be different. I can go ahead and tell you that now. But remember what we said at the beginning. We're going to be honest and we're going to be transparent before God. And while we're worshiping, while we're worshiping, because this is a time of worship, I'm going to ask as soon as you feel the Lord tugging on your heart that you come to this altar and just talk to him. Today ain't about I got to do this or I got to do that. Today's about doing business with God. God wants to take us to another level, but it starts with self-assessment. Not everybody around me assessment because I ain't worried about them. If we're ever going to be what God is calling us to be, it's got to start with the self-assessment. Because see, this dude looked down and he said, I got a daddy. And he says, I hope this helps somebody in Luke 15 and 18. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. See, let me say this. I need you to hear me. The first person he spoke to was himself. This may sound tough, but it's the truth. Because you are out of order if the first person you speak to or about is not yourself. See, too many times we want to point fingers and blame and talk about everybody else when the fact is God never called the world to change because you're here. He called you to change the world because you're here. The first thing we got to pray is not God change them and that, but God change me and my set, my mindset. Change me and my attitude. Change my heart, oh God, if that's you. I need to do some self-assessing. Would you come? We got to take off the mask. We got to be transparent. I need to do some self assessing. If that's you, would you come? My Lord, the altar should be filling up right now. Let me be clear because this is church, this is deliverance. This is God doing work in this place today. Something I need for us to do. I need everybody in this room to put your hand on your chest and say, I forgive me. Because some of us have found ourselves at times not been able to be what God's called us to be simply because we don't think we deserve forgiveness. 
And to be quite honest with you, you're absolutely right. You don't deserve it. But John 3.16 tells me that he loved me enough. Maybe you're here today and there's some things you need to forgive yourself from. Would you come? Those hard feelings, that bitterness, that unforgiveness, would you come? When he came to his senses, he says, I'm going home. <laughs> if you here or you watching online and you need to come home, if you need to give or you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, today is your day. It's time to come home. Would you come? Maybe you got hurt by somebody in the church or you got lied on. Maybe they said some things they shouldn't have said. Maybe they did some things they shouldn't have done, but God says, come on home. Is that you? Would you come? And there's been folks here been wondering the whole time, how's this time with Father's Day? And we're going to see it right here in Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. The father saw him from a long way off. And that means he was waiting on him. That means he never gave up on his son. A father's love, he was there. He never gave up. Today I got one more call for all the fathers. All the mothers, all the parents, all the grandparents. You praying and you waiting and you waiting and you praying for that son. You waiting for that little girl. And you sitting on your front porch and you looking down the road you're saying, Lord, just send them home. The father didn't sit on the front porch doing nothing. He was praying. He was seeking God. He was pouring his heart out for the sake of his son. So today, the last call, all the parents, all the grandparents, you waiting on that lost child, you waiting on that lost loved one, you looking up the street, you waiting for them to come home. See the atmosphere starting to shift. Now we're getting into an anointing of intercession. If you hear, if you're that father, if you're that mother, that grandparent, I need you to get up this altar and begin to seek God. Seeking for that son, for that daughter, for that mother, for that father. I need you up here seeking God. Maybe they lost. Maybe they need healing. Whatever they need, you waiting on that answer today. We calling them home. God wants to move in this place today. This altar's open. This altar's open.
Love.
God good. Praise the Lord. Mm. All hearts clear today. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you see the situation and you see, Lord, the mental anguish and the mental torment that those who are closest to the situation are going through. Lord, we know that all things work together for our good. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you because you are still working. And, Lord, we know, Lord, that you're going to work this out. And, Lord, we praise you for the fact that you are on the throne and you are in control. Lord, bring a peace that passes understanding. Lord, in this situation, Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All hearts clear. God is good, church. We good? Uh, don't forget about